So uh, welcome everybody um, and welcome back to some of you uh, who we haven't seen for a while. Um, um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm delighted today to be able to welcome Matty Wakefield, or should I say Dr. Matty Wakefield. Uh, <laughs> most recently, uh, Matty defended uh, his doctoral thesis. Um, Two weeks ago, yes. two weeks ago, uh, and uh, is currently revising for final submission. Um, before that, uh, you would have known Matthew as uh, being uh, a PhD student involved in various technical aspects of the class. Uh, of many of the classes involved in in all of our classes at various times, from honors theory to master's proposal uh, writing. Hello, Lucas. Um, um, to first year sociology. So Matthew's been a real um, presence in the department in the last, particularly the last five years, um, six years actually. Uh, um, he, st he started his studies in Stellenbosch uh, eight, eight or nine years ago. And uh, welcome to all of you. And um, yeah, we're delighted to have a chance to now listen to him while he's been listening to us for so long. Um, Give a seminar today. So, without further ado, you know him, but let's hear about his work. Um, 45 minutes as usual, and then time for questions. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Bernard. Thank you very much for a uh, lovely intro introduction. I think now people have a high expectation, so let me dismiss <laughs> that. Um, but really, it is a genuine pleasure, um, and I firstly want to thank Bernard for giving me the opportunity and Stephen, um, the PI and co-PI of the Indexing Transformation Seminar Series. Um, and I hope that this presentation will be useful for all of you. Um, so what I've done is I'm not going to rehash my, my PhD research. I'm not going to just give you a, a rundown of what I've done, but I'm trying to think about um, some interesting points of contact that I've had during my research and some pieces of feedback, I think, and piece of advice I might give to some of the students that are here today. And, and I wouldn't be so brave to say I'll give feedback or advice to the staff. But anyway, um, so this is my presentation. It's um, it's based off my PhD. Again, I, like I say, I'm not rehashing my PhD here. Um, and if you do want to think about some of these questions further, read about these questions further, I do have written about this in my PhD. But anyway, so the structure of this presentation today um, it's only a few slides, but I'm really going to explore the nuances and implications of a range of contestations in the PHA. The PHA is this area, and I'll, I'll give you an introduction to the PHA, but it's the Philippi Horticulture Area, a place that even if you live in Cape Town, a lot of people don't really know about, and I think it's a very important space. And when one does research in that space, one finds, uh, well, I found that it was very interesting and very useful uh, space to do research, but also quite a fragmented space. So that's what I'm going to be reflecting on today. So how will we get there, this path of this of the seminar today? I'm going to give you an introduction to the PHA, the site of contestation. Since the mid-1850s and probably before, uh, I'll introduce five points of contestation that I think are important to understand the PHA and, and the space. But also, I think it's uh, these contest forms of contestation, these points of contestation, are also very transferable to different parts of Cape Town. I will also show you the role of the PHA campaign, and I'll introduce what the PHA campaign is, both practically and analytically or empirically. And then I'll draw some prelim conclusions regarding research and such sites. So I have different conclusions from my PhD research around environmental activism. This will be some sort of a different conclusion. Okay, so the PHA is delineated by this red boundary here. Um, and it's on the Cape Plus, as you can see here's Table Bay uh, and, and Bobo and Mitchell's Plain. So as you can see, it's this is a, a land use diagram. And it's also got a very different land use to the rest of the Cape Flats. We already know that the, the, the politics of the ge geography and the social history of the Cape Flats, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that a bit. But really, the Cape Flats and a large parts of Cape Town during the <coughs> colonial period and the period of colonial conquest around the 1600s and, and on from that, was for strategic purposes framed as a place of, of, of nothingness, right? And that's a very um, colonial logic that we all are taught about and we all know about, right? 
framing something as nothing, as having nothing, as a as a site that one can, the colonial administration, etc., can locate itself within. So, the Cave Flats as a barren hinterland, a place, and this is Lizette Robbie's book, who I'll talk about now, of a, a place of total nothingness prior to the 1800s, a classic uh, colonial trope. Lizette Robbie writes a book, a, a professor of journalism in South, in, at this university, writes this book about the Philippi Germans, who I will discuss by the end of this presentation, you might have a bit of an idea about. But really, they are German immigrants that come into the PHA and they start farming. They're brought in by the British government and they start farming. And it's this idea of no one else could farm the Cape Flats, no one else could farm this area, so we had to bring the Germans in to do it. Um, Lizette Robbie writes basically a narrative, a retelling of this history from so, sort of fragments, social fragments and, and archival work that she's done. And it very much plays into this idea of the German immigrants as these heroes that provide for Cape Town at a time where um, the British government and the British administration hadn't been able to um, secure food and agriculture on, on in the area. So the British um, administration, like I say, brought in these immigrants and they were known for the agricultural prowess in, in, in Germany. But when they come here, they, they the very different type of politics around their identity, around their role and their position um, gets played out. So one could, they were basically here, again, a quote from her book, which is very well read. And I think if you ask people in the PHA about this, most people will reference her book. So again, what kind of telling, what kind of narrative and who gets to tell the story and what kind of positive spin does it have on these German immigrants? And my, re, my thesis and the role of this organization I'll talk about engages with that politics of knowledge, politics of telling a history, a certain type of history. So then we, I'm going to jump forward a couple of years from so the, the mid 1850s to 2018. This area is still a site of contestation and a site of much value. There's a lot of um, there's an argument that hey Steph, thanks for making um, that 70 percent of Cape Town's vegetables are grown in the PHA, which is probably shocking to most of us. Some of our students have been there. 70 around 70 percent of Cape Town's vegetables are grown here, and it's interesting to see, interesting to reflect upon. Um, do we know that as people living in Cape Town, around Cape Town, do we know that? And why, if we do not know that, why? And what implications does that have for groups operating in the PHA as, as well? So they, what Lizette Robbie's work does, it's a bit small, maybe I'm just getting old. Um, what Lizette Robbie's work does is basically justify the role of the German immigrants in this area. Very favorable role. No one could farm this area. This area was barren a hinterland of nothingness, and then it gets produced by German immigrants into a place of value, right? And who, who gets to benefit from that value is another question. Um, the success of the German immigrants, again, this is, and this plays out in current discourse around court cases, and I'll talk about that, but it's a very important part of understanding the area, this his, this heritage, and it's not, a, it's, it's a heritage and a narrative that con gets perpetuated with the current, um, the descendants of these original um, immigrants. But at what cost? So the PHA, very valuable, 70% of Cape Town's vegetables, but what, at what cost? The kind of farming that we see there is industrial, commercial agriculture that is damaging the soil, damaging the aquifer, um, the Cape Flats aquifer. So that's another point I must bring up. You see this darker line here. That is the Cape Flats aquifer. That's the boundary of the Cape Flats aquifer. To many, the Cape Flats aquifer is unknown. But the Cape Flats aquifer, by, and I'll talk about the activist view of the Cape Flats aquifer, but in many ways it made this area, especially this area, the PHA, um, it, it protected it from drought during, you know, day zero and so on. So we see framings of drought, crisis, resource scarcity, and this again maintains that the PHA is an important site. But when there's value, when the place is important and there's capital to be made, etc., we know there's fragments, there's, we know there's contestations and, and so on. So I frame it as a site, and I think many would, a, a site as contestation due to silence histories, which I'll note a bit more, but that work is very largely undone. There's no, there's no work on silent histories, silenced histories in the PHA. One needs to ask why. And, and um, also we need to ask someone to basically do that. Um, there's also the Group Areas Act, and I'll, I'll touch on this later, that's a very important part, migration, national migration, um, a lot of people moving from the Eastern Cape, et cetera, moving to that area. 
and capital, food, water, silica, and development. So obviously I've spoken about the Cape Flats aquifer, very important water resource, um, but also food, 70% of Cape Town's vegetables again. Silica, there's a extremely rich deposits of silica. What does silica do? Makes glass, we need glass. So also a very valuable space. And then there's a lot of development happening in the PHA. It's a site where there is nothingness again, so one can develop the area, right? So these are raising a lot of questions that one would need to ask and I had to ask and, and address in my research. Okay, so I thought I'll pull out five oppositional frames that I think is interesting to understand the PHA and quite important. And, so, and I'll, 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 I'll talk to these oppositional frameworks, but I'm also going to show how people work them. One of them is the colonial immigrants uh, versus indigenous populations. This is, a, his, this is a story that everyone in this department will know, um, and I hope more, more than just outside this department, but the colonial versus the indigenous and how we think about two river urban park, et cetera, spaces like that that are, un, that are contested due to certain legacies, certain heritage and histories and how that is silenced. So again, this idea that Cape Town was a barren place, it needed to be established as a um, supply station for the Dutch East India Company, et cetera. Again, this idea that we must come and develop. There is nothing here. But there's also in heritage impact assessments. So when people do heritage impact assessments, which are important for developing in this area, and some people see them as a crutch uh, or an important tool, and I'm sure Tumi would agree with this. We had the discussion about EIAs. But HIAs are also important um, in establishing rights around heritage. But this the idea of tangible and intangible heritage play heavily into that. So how do you prove that someone, a group of people, um, a heritage should be recognized in a space when the, the logic, the, the frameworks of heritage impact assessments are favor, only favor or very much favor tangible heritage. And that's a heritage that many would argue and, and some have critiqued that um, favors colonial administrations, com colonial populations come into the area. The Cape Elite versus German farmers, and this is quite an interesting one. So uh, Lizette Robbie establishes this uh, very interesting account of the German far um, immigrants coming in and being a population that was oppressed or suppressed and had nothing. And it's very much a hero narrative of them coming through. But they also, when they pulled into um, and they were asked to come farm in the area, it wasn't a, a quick establishment. And this is what she plays with a lot. They were again oppressed as a population, as a group that came to the area due to the Cape Elite. The Cape Elite at that time, the British, etc., had a hunting club and the Cape Flats was used as a place to go hunt. And when they tried to push against, so the, they would come into the area and hunt um, and ruin the crops and the very little progress that the German immigrants had made up to that point, when they took it to court, one of the, the judges was a member of the hunting club. So again, <laughs> Um, yeah, there's a lot of politics around insider outsider and power, etc. Dutch farmers saw Germans as intruders. So again, maybe this is an interesting piece of the, the history of the area that also is silenced in many ways. Um, sometimes one can take a frame, uh, take an analysis that the colonial always came in with a lot of power, but even with the German immigrants coming in, they were sort of not seen as insiders to some degree by the Dutch farmers. The Dutch farmers try to push against this, but they had the support of the British administration, so um, they prospered or, or got allotments of land, etc. Coming into a bit more of the modern era, uh, farming versus displaced or migrant groups. Group Areas Act, we all know the politics of pushing um, certain groups outside of the cities. And where did they move? Did they get flats? And what happens is people start moving around the area, and as the development imperative as it becomes important to develop housing, the shrinks, as you can see through time. PHA shrinks, this important, valuable um, agricultural land shrinks through time due to housing imperatives, etc. cetera, um, which some people have said, okay, housing is important. We need housing first um, and there's, you know, housing waiting lists, et cetera, activist groups that it was interesting. I did my master's on an activist group that fought for housing and then this group that I did my, my PhD research on basically argued the opposite. Protect this area, protect our food, and then we can develop housing elsewhere. So, and there can also be um, contact points of similarity between the two groups I've done research on, um, <laughs> densifying the city, et cetera, et cetera. 
farming versus development, and this is probably the most important in the PHA at the moment. These spaces are snapped up, old farms, etc., are bought out by developers, right? And especially this part here that I focused on in my, in my PhD, it's called the Oakland City Development, um, and it's meant to be a development that's going to develop housing in the PHA for people that need housing. When you take a closer look, it's actually mixed-use development, and only very wealthy people are actually going to be benefiting from that development. Also, what that does, when you take all these pieces out, this land here at the bottom that still exists becomes very valuable. It's agricultural land, but it becomes extremely valuable. And that develops the contentious politics around land. And that has only increased with this development that we're seeing here. And then agroecological farming versus commercial farming. So one might see the, the PHA as a farming area, and one does not really engage the, the method, the model, the framing of farming. Right? Um, farming, industrial, commercial models of farming have been recently more so um, critiqued. And the group that I did research with on, et cetera, has a different framework, a different formula for farming. They don't want to do this commercial, industrial, um, destructive, maybe, for, uh, model of farming. So they moved to an agroecological way of farming. And that taps into the ideas of crisis, day zero, scarcity, et cetera. And they leverage it a lot. And I'll talk about that now. And I made them green. Okay. <laughs> So into the PHA food and, farm, uh, food and farming campaign, I'll just say, call it the PHA campaign. It's really exhausting to say the whole thing. Um, this is was my focus of my research. I want to do research on this group. So now you understand, you need to have some contextual understanding of this space in, in which I was doing research, right? And some of the debates, contestations, and players in this area. That's very important. Um, and I'll, I'll, that, I'll hammer home that point just now, don't worry. But Nazir Sande is the head of this group the PHA farming campaign, uh, or PHA campaign, and he had to move out of the PHA. He lived in the PHA, and then during apartheid, he had to move out. So he was in a farming area and had some sort of relation to farming. We don't know, can't, can't really establish how, how committed he was to farming and on what scale he was farming. It was more like subsistence farming, but he moved out. And when he moved back into the area um, after apartheid, he, had to, he wanted to buy his farm in the area, two hectares, but he had to ask the white um, landowners on the left side of his property and the right side of his property to allow him as a colored person to come and buy in the area. And that kind of politics of race as well, but also farming model, as I'll show later, is very important in understanding the PHA's position in this area. So he comes back to farm as a commercial farmer, and he does reasonably well. He's selling a, a, a ton of tomatoes to pick and pay in Plumstead, a, a, I think it's a week. So he's doing pretty well. But the imperative of commercial agriculture is to expand. And he was not very happy with that. He had put his um, life into, into the farm, and that's the way he was trained by the government-funded um, programs, expand. And uh, this is a question that a lot of people like Mzee would know far better than I around land reform and, and agriculture and so on. But um, so he started buying into this model. And when he realized that he had put his entire life on the line for this business to succeed, it was 2008. What happened in 2008? World um, recession, economic uh, recession, and the price of synthetic fertilizers, which the commercial model always depends upon, and even small scale, but the commercial model, especially in the PHA, depended upon. His input costs went over the, uh, through the roof, and he, he, so he couldn't continue farming. He pretty much lost everything. And um, then he realized he needed to find a different way to farm. This wasn't viable for him. And especially on a, on a two hectare piece of uh, land, the commercial model just wasn't paying off. So what I'm trying to get at with this point uh, is the embedded logics of when you become a farmer, when you buy land, when through the land reform process, there's certain logics, there's certain expectations, especially with regards to agriculture. Um, but then eventually he moves away from it and says there needs to be another way. I like farming, um, but I, I don't want to farm like this. So he develops a, an agroecological model of farming. Um, he didn't develop it. Obviously, agroecological principles um, are well established, but he started um, buying into those and moving away from the model that is hegemonic in the PHA. Everyone, pretty much everyone in the PHA that produces food is a commercial farmer through industrial, commercialized, 
um, and, uh, and destructive farming practices using synthetic fertilizers and so on. So then he tries to develop a, a decolonial a, a farming model in the PHA, where he bases it on the history, well, certain groups in the area that he that have been called the that lived in, the, that farmed in, had a different way of living, and their re relation to the land, and I don't want to over romanticize this without evidence, but um, the, their relation to the land. Um, he finds and the PHA campaign finds is more productive, more conducive to different livelihoods. So that's what he's trying to tap into there. Something I'll raise later, and I have a point on this, but um, need to ask who gets to talk about those narratives, those decolonial narratives, who gets to talk about that and on what evidence does one base one's framework and, and narrative um, and, and how accurate is it actually? So the, the PHA campaign, we get to this point, which is in the last five, six years, it's well, at least since 2011, um, it positions itself as an ally to all the farmers in the area that's really outspoken about protecting the area for agriculture, protect your farmland, or protect your water. But in many ways, they also oppose to the, agricul the agriculture in the, in, in the area because they oppose to the model. So that puts them in a weird position. And, and the his historically connected farmers are very aware of this and they have significant contestations. So I wanted to understand, and what I looked at eventually was the sites of activism. How did the PHA campaign, how do a, a group basically of a, a small group of people, how are they able to contest? How are they able to position themselves? But also how are they able to contest these frameworks that we see playing out here? Big money into commercial agriculture or development. And if you're not doing that, you're not making value, you're not a big player in the area, so who cares? How do they, how do they work that? How do they position themselves? So, my suggestion is through various forms of and sites of activism, and this is, you know, I'm sure someone would have done re this research and found different ways of understanding the PHA and their work, or the PHA campaign, or other actors in the PHA. But anyway, court cases as techno scientific contestations. I write about this extensively in my thesis, but it's interesting when you go to court, like the PHA campaign have repeatedly done on on donations, on generous donations from other people. They have. Court is obviously very expensive to go to court. So they've had to go to court against developers continually over since 2011, continually, and basically have jobs. The two people that um, are the head of the PHA campaign, Nazir Sonde and Susanna Coleman, they've had to basically put their lives on hold and res keep responding and keep going to court and putting along the line to fight against development in the PHA, development over the Cape Flats aquifer, which is very important and um, commercial, the commercial agricultural model, which they, in the context of climate change, they don't think is valuable and don't think, don't think that it's actually viable in the future. But the court case, when you go to court, you can't only leverage aspirational dialogue. You can't say, I want to protect the water for the water's sake. I want everyone to farm in a different way. That doesn't fly in court, regardless of who the judge is. So you have to play the game through the language in which the court speaks, and that very much favors developers. But then if you're interested in that, my second chapter is on that. Spatial planning. We see the implications of um, um, problematic spatial planning. People's livelihoods being negatively affected, agricultural income, viability being negatively affected due to spatial planning changes, right? There's also ideas of insurgent or participatory planning, which actually doesn't really become a thing in, in, in Cape Town until the mid 80s, 90s. Vanessa Watson from UC, the, the late Vanessa Watson from UCT has written about this. And, and obviously there's others that have spoken about the importance of in, uh, participatory planning. Planning from a top down approach, a bureaucratic planning is something that's taking place and continues to take place in Cape Town. So the PHA campaign have tried to insert themselves into these processes use the public participation process and so on to insert a different logic, a different view of the PHA and how space should be used in the PHA. They're also around community politics. So one of the fundamental fragments or fragmenting um, frameworks of the PHA is social. People have different legacies, different histories and different views about the area. So the PHA have tried, the PHA campaign have tried to resist this, have tried to work against these different ideas, but when one is a minority in a group in, in the area like the PHA, a small two hectare farm in a, like a 2000 hectare area, they have very little legitimacy um, to say anything about the future of the area, right? 
So what they've done is try to use various quite aspirational, but um, frameworks of community engagement and so on to try and find, to try and push their point across and find connections and uh, and touch points between between the farmers and and them and other actors. But sometimes that becomes problematic. So they've sometimes implicitly been seen as representing everyone, the disenfranchised of the PHA. In many ways, they do not even know who they are. So it's an interesting who gets to represent, who's seen as representing groups and what is actually happening and how that works into legitimacy. And then there's also um, external framings that um, outside the court cases, you often will hear in, in the media, you'll see that you will, it will be argued that the that Nazir Sunday, the PHA campaign, they represent the farmers in the PHA. Go talk to one white commercial farmer in the area and you'll get a very different story. But who interviews those white commercial farmers? Not very many people, actually. Um, Z is a fan of this book, Pro a Promised Land by Carl Kemp. He actually goes and interviews some white commercial farmers in the area. They are notoriously shy to talk to the media. They've been burnt before by the press and by the city of Cape Town. And their, their, his, their, their story, their, their voice in these debates, which I'm saying might be a problem, I'm not, I'm not absolving them, I'm not, I'm, it is problematic, um, their position in the area and their politics for the area, I guess, but their voice is very often not heard. And the PHA campaign hold a lot of media space. So again, that's interesting. A small group holds a lot of media space. The people that make this area an area of value technically, and maybe I'm buying into Lizette Robbie's narrative here, but um, people that make this into an area of value that farm all the vegetables don't really get to be heard by the media or in court cases. And I don't think they're bothered, really. Um, so it's interesting to understand how aspirational dialogue around all of these uh, um, spheres or sites of activism plays out. They, it's an aspirational, it's an alternative, and it's strategic. Um, one cannot always leverage this idea of decolonial um, eco-feminist farming for the people. That often doesn't fly. And even though they've tried to leverage it, um, often in often um, many spaces, that doesn't actually hold much currency. So research in the PHA, and here comes uh, a little bit of a note for some of the students and myself as well. But it's obviously the PHA is a clearly fragmented and fractured space, right? And doing research in the area is admittedly very tricky. So the area is obviously very valuable and that creates a lot of contestation. Historically, the histories of contestation in the area are important, but the value of this area for various means, not only for agroecological farming, but for agriculture in general and for water and the city of, and, and for the protection of the Cape Flats Aquifer, which is super important. Um, this area is extremely valuable because of that. So there's, um, when one does research in this area, it's, it's, and this is what many students have done, and some journalists, etc., have fallen into this trap, have just bought into Nazir Sandez, um, the, the thing that you read, the narrative you read in the media, right? Or they, I think there's two articles, really, that I could find after extensive searching from the commercial farmers resisting that. So it's interesting to see, if you do research in the area, who, where will you get pushed toward Nazir Sandez? He is very outspoken. And what kind of account of the PHA will you have when you only listen to the PHA campaign. So yeah, your site of, and your, your focus of your research is very important. It'll give you a certain, um, it'll influence the way your data is collected. And then the PHA campaign also leverages diverse forms of support, which I think is very interesting and very important for understanding how they operate in the area, how they gain legis legitimacy and strategically leverage legitimacy and resources. So. They, in many ways, support the white environmentalists, well, gain the support of the white environmentalists from Cape Town. One of many of their members are people from Cape Town that are, uh, what do they call themselves? People from the southern suburbs who love <coughs> leafy vegetables or something. Um, but this, the PHA campaign are not shying away from that because if, at times, because if they didn't have that, they wouldn't be able to go to any court and they wouldn't be able to afford any lawyers or pro bono legal work, or anything like that. A lot of their connections come through this white environmentalist framework, but also they are leveraging strategically at times decolonial social justice narratives, which benefit them. And there's a lot of resources that they can draw on through that. But these strategic alliances, which is obvious, they come with certain costs. 
um, being framed in relation to white environmentalists as a small group in the area, they are often dismissed as just being two randos that don't uh, really have any space in the PHA, don't have a voice in the PHA, and might actually just be uh, a face for white environmentalists in the in the in city of Cape, well, in the southern suburbs that want to protect the environment for the environment's sake. A trope of white environmentalism that's played out in South Africa for for generations. Um, okay, so concluding. So now we can all wake up again. Um, the PHA is obviously a contested site that is often misrepresented, as I as I note. Um, if you only speak to the commercial farmers, which is very tricky to get interviews with them, and I have had interviews with them, they have a certain area, they have a certain narrative. This area means nothing without us. Um, but there's also an interesting politics around white farmers in South Africa. A lot of the ones, the white farmers that I spoke to said, shit, I'll sell any day, I'll leave. When my farm gets to a certain valuation, I'll leave. There's no, um, we'll stick on and keep farming. So maybe that's something that's not really um, given much space in land reform debates. But um, it's obviously a contested site. The court is, is by many seen as a space that is apolitical and will, truth and justice will be born out of the courts. In many ways, that's not true. Um, what is the constitutional court just evicted someone that was in the house for 85 years yesterday. Um, but yeah, so many people have argued that the environmentalism in South Africa um, and environmental movements have only leveraged the courts and not thought about the social justice, mass mobilization, politics of mo uh, movement building. Uh, some people have found, and they, I do in my seventh chapter of my thesis, trace the, uh, important judgments in the courts um, that have void uh, a lot of environmentalists in the country, but something like the slap judgment, strategic litigation against public participation, almost silenced environmentalists in the country. Mines were getting a lot of flack from public intellectuals, etc., and they took them to court and almost sued them, and they almost won. So it's, very t it's a very tenuous thing, uh, a tenuous relationship, and some people that argue that environmentalism is extremely strong in the country, I think that narrative, that slap judgment especially, could reanimate that space for critique. Short-term research in the PHA, um, which is very common, and there's actually a lot of students at universities nearby and across the world that come into the PHA and do research for a week or two, and uh, they probably listen to the PHA campaign, and they write a certain narrative about the PHA. But I think it's absolutely essential to stay in the space and engage with various actors, and this is something you should all think about for your own research. When you speak to certain people, this narrative is an idea that you're getting. And diversifying the conversations that you're having might bring, even if it doesn't change your conclusion, it might bring a different understanding of what's happening in that space. Uh, the PHA campaign is a useful group to think through and understand these various threads. I found it very useful to use it as a site uh, to understand what's happening in the PHA. But I had to, and perhaps, I, I hope I've done this, be, been able to weigh what they've said with some sort of critical analysis and not buy into the activist logic. And there's, one of my examiners was kind enough to say I didn't buy into it. And so, I, you know, I hope I've navigated that. And then pushing different ideas in the PHA. Ones that, as a, as a, as a person, I very much agree with, agroecological, decolonial, anti-development, it's a very, very hard task in the PHA and one that doesn't get a lot of traction and one that I don't think will really play out. I think, um, and I use in my thesis, Jacqueline Cox's work of different environmental imaginaries and show that understanding the environment, nat natural resources through a functionalist perspective, instrumentalist pr perspective that one can use the environment, the natural resources here for value, meaning let's grow a lot of food. Don't care how you make it, just grow it. Extract the water use it for value, um, that's very much the legacy and the narrative that's been pushed. But in many ways, how long will that last in a city that's already experienced a drought and will continue to have, and this area is going to decline in productivity through time. The, the water is already in the in the Cape Flats aquifer is extremely polluted already. So how long will that narrative last is my question. And then a cool picture to end. Oh, honest, some of our students went to the PHA with uh, a lesson as yes on their day and some of the students in the room. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you, Matthew. Um, um, does anybody want to ask the first question or engage, engage Matthew? Um, Rita. So I see Rita's hand. I see Rita's hand. Let me let me nominate a few people. Rita, uh, Lloyd, I saw his hand. Anybody else? Can we go? The first round? Okay. The two of you. Go. I guess I just wanted to ask with the um, PHA, because when we went there, there were the Jews and stuff, and they're struggling a lot with like farming of the Jews. Yeah. So how is it they're able to produce 70% of Cape Town's veggies if they already had that issue with the Jews? <laughs> Yeah, so the dunes is a very, it was called the Duna, that's my Afrikaans being very poor, but it was a place that was just known for its dunes and the the German heritage, the German immigrants coming in and calming the dunes, um, slaying the dunes, so to speak, um, is basically this narrative that they were able to make it productive. But some interviews I had, the dunes are severely reduced and when when the PHA, you remember looking south of the PHA and seeing how they had been um, basically extract from the area because of their silicate deposits. Yeah. So the Germans, the German immigrants were able to deal with the dunes to some degree and sell it for silica, um, sell it for its value in silica, and that enabled agriculture, but continually the, the production or the use of the sand for silica has enabled it actually to become an agricultural zone. So extraction for extraction. Right. Matthew, this is Fascinating, really, really interesting. I, I mean, I have two questions actually. One is sort of slightly technical, and other is that, that map, your very first slide, that map. Um, I mean, that the first thing that struck me, I, I didn't realize how big it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you mentioned the history of the, the race, and I'm wondering, my first question is, you know, what was the designation under the group areas like? How did that work? You know, yeah. I, I, I'd like more on that. The second question is, I'd like you to say a bit more about this kind of distinction between commercial farming and the agroecological. I mean, it's something I'm very familiar with. Um, maybe the history and, you know, agroecological. Is this in the context of growing debates about food security and lethal or urban yeah. agriculture and this sort of thing? Is this, is this something that's, that's, that's really growing now, this notion? Um, how, how, how do you assess it? It's kind of significant outside of Cape Town. Yep. Thanks, Lloyd. Um, it was a white area. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, so the, guess, yeah. and so then the, the surrounds of it um, become developed as, uh, you know, so this area was obviously bigger during its um, original allotment. And then basically we see this, uh, this movement of Colored and black populations, especially colored populations, moving toward it, right? Um, now, asking about the composition of the Cape, uh, of the PHA now, so very white. Um, there's an area of Brown's Farm, which is a settlement some of us know in, in Philippi and so on. Still on the outskirts, the, the area has become increasingly um, populated by colored and, uh, and black residents. But the area is, and this, so these chops basically have accounted for some colored, colored and black populations moving farmers com there's about seven commercial farmers in the area all are what actually i think one's covered um, and bought in he was an old prison security guard etc and brought, bought in some of the land your question about commercial versus agroecological so the commercial farmers that you would speak to would say well agroecological is a cool idea but it doesn't work and it doesn't produce food and some people would say we need more food resources are getting scarce so we can't impact an area like this we need to let the commercial farmers do what they've done. They will find ways, they will find technical adjustments to develop food, even in drought, even in um, with um, soil declining in productivity, etc. So in many ways, what I'm saying is currently the agroecological framework is seen as utopian and very, uh, it's not seen as something that's a real player. A lot of people uh, argue that Nazir Sonde is too, too hectic to farm, it's just a garden, not even a farm he doesn't produce, produce enough food. There is this ongoing debate, um, which Cheryl um, invited me to a conference, Karoo conference. So there's an ongoing debate between academics, between small scales and, and, and large scale. And I think the large scale is winning out, the commercial large scale idea. Nazir Sunday and one part of, one chapter of my thesis, I looked at this, he has a two hectare model and he's trying to implement this in various places in the PHA as hasn't worked not once. 
except from his space that he's using. So the debates are, in theory, there's a lot of, um, especially support from you know people outside of South Africa or the southern southern suburbs, etc., for uh, the agroecological. But there's an inconvenient fact of these people producing 70% of the vegetables for Cape Town. So yeah, hope that answers your question. Others, I can see Cheryl is going to go now. Um, <coughs> Tumi and then uh, Kate, maybe you can take them in a group, and then Shahid. So, Paul, you ready to write? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> she draws us a comment already. Okay, cool. Okay, Cheryl. So, I have lots of um, questions. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to take them in groups. Thank you. It's great to actually hear, you know, the politics of these, though. And also, the way in which you position it in relation to the research challenges. Um, so I was interested in the comment about planning. Um, and just looking at the map, I mean, which you pulled up again in response to Lloyd's question, something made me think if you zoom out, because yeah. you've been very focused on this particular contested space, and there's a lot that resonates with the work you're doing in the Karoo around contestations and you know, empty spaces, etc. But if you actually zoom out and put it in a larger spatial context and all the contestation that you raise and think about what the future of this area could be in a larger scale mm. of a metropolitan area within the province, um, you know, those contestations are playing out in Stellenbosch between farmland and under yep. the bottoms, et cetera. So I'm just wondering how much you've thought about that. Um, I, you know, I, I agree with your concern around technocratic, bureaucratic spatial planning, but, but one does, I do think, it's on the level of planning, um, well, it's happening, but it's also probably required, yep. to manage all those conflicts between housing and industry and having people close to where they're working and all those issues. So, mm -hmm. so trying to think about the future of this area in a larger yeah. spatial frame, what, 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 how might you think about that? That would be yep. question one, and I'll stop there. Well, fascinating I'd like for you to speak more about this language of the courts in relation to development. What, what, what is it for me? What has been prioritized in this language? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Kate? Hi, Matt. Fabulous as always. Um, <laughs> Stop it. Is just perhaps to speak a little bit more about, you said, the unbotheredness of the commercial farmers and their voice not mm. being in the media, not being in the courts. Maybe is there unbotheredness coming from places like? Happy with their position that they have, maybe they're not the ones who want to be disrupted. Does it come from them just not having an attachment to the space and we'll give them money and move out? Just to yeah, ask yep. more about why they are not. Cool. Shaheen. Thanks, uh, Matthew. <laughs> um, I appreciate your method, right? which is brilliant. I mean, going into the complexity around contestation. But I guess my, my question is, what's at stake in the contestation? Because I hear you say things like accuracy, <laughs> right? So then one is working, moving into an evaluative framework. Yep. So of course, something like commercial farming, that people who say, no, it's a structure, and people they say, no, it's useful. Hmm. So what? How do we resolve that? How do you resolve it? So what are the stakes of these different you know, that you're getting? And the reason I'm pointing to evaluation is because if there are different claims being made, mm. then the evaluation criteria should be different. Yeah. It's not so clear to me that I can that I can simply balance a historically privileged farmer who says, okay, I leave, but like there's a history to that. Right? Yeah. For example, a lot of white farmers in South Africa have all, have all mortgaged their farms. Mm -hmm. This is what landowners do when an economy goes into crisis. The irony is that they got those farms because they loaned the money from the state. Who was giving them free loans? There's nothing free about this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, I'm thinking like, yeah, what are the evaluated criteria? 
And what happens when you have different registers of claims? Yeah. And I can point you to, for example, okay, we'll come back later. That's Sweet. all. <laughs> really sure. Okay. Lovely. <laughs> you can have a second round. Yeah. yeah. Please show I have one. Okay, thank you for the questions. Cheryl, um, zooming out and looking at provincially and managing conflicts. Yeah, so there's this idea that people have written about, the person in uh, geography at Stellenbosch, uh, Anil Horn. So she's argued that uh, urban edges are population control frameworks, and that's how they're meant to work. Urban edges are meant to define areas that can be used for production, whatever it is. Um, but they also delineate, so there's a, there's a logic to it and it's meant to be productive for various different um, reasons. But the one big problem uh, that the PHA campaign, and I, I understand I'll answer your question provincially just now, but um, this urban edge was so essential, this wedge here, was so essential to delimiting housing from agriculture. And it's a, it's a boundary that has, has um, stood since it was incepted, this area. The ridiculous way in which that was changed through a, a small planning decision that was just um, taken back, actually, it was ch changed, but then it was already in the next um, MSDF, so it became official. So all these people's livelihoods that, um, and the, the rights that they enjoy because they live in an agriculturally zoned area um, were taken away because of basically a, a weird, fluke bureaucratic decision. But um, zooming out, I think it is interesting, I think, the PHA can, the PHA, so this is a question of productivity. How much of the PHA would be needed for it to still be productive? And I think that somewhat answers your question. There needs to be allowance for housing, obviously. Um, spatial development planning is important in finding balances between housing, agriculture, etc. cetera. But um, the question of productivity is one that in the courts, and this will come to Timmy's question, but the one in the courts that um, justifies further development and to further development. And then it comes into a question of urban agriculture. Um, of we can we don't need actually half of that to farm. We can farm on far less. So uh, I think it's important. I think the planning um, tribunals, etc., are useful in delineating and in showing that land can be used for different purposes. But also they, I track a history of how planning decisions have been vetoed by Patricia per, Delors, etc. For certain agendas, so yeah, it's an it's interesting question. Then on the on the provincial scale, yeah, metro. yeah, metro scale. It seems like a, a small place to really think about when you're thinking of a of a metro or provincial scale. Um, but one that remains with the reports that are written remains extremely valuable due to its um, proximity to the city and its proximity to this aquifer, which are absolutely essential. So <coughs> that's an important aspect for this um, area. So proximity to the city and carbon emissions and the lo logic of climate change, again, is, is used there to justify why this area should be protected specifically um, and why. But there's some of the farmers that said we can just farm in Paul. Don't worry about it. Uh, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but somewhat. I hope. Um, but you can press my button in your second round if you want. Um, to me, the language of the courts, what is prioritized? So to justify development, you have to develop an EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment, HIA, Heritage Impact Assessment. Um, but really, it actually depends on how many EIAs you can develop. How much money do you have to get um, consultants firms to keep developing them? You will get your answer. And we see that knows that very well. Um, you will get your answer eventually. People need to take on jobs to get a certain answer, and uh, it's sad to say, but there's the objectivity in those reports are questionable. Um, so the language that the courts like is not aspirational, very, and someone to cheat his question, but um, it's not aspirational, it's not climate change, and you can instill doubt in someone's mind through these um, different you know, logics, aspirational logics, etc., and that's how the PHA campaign actually won the court case. That was so influential for their movement because of the unknown fact of climate change that no one could really measure, no one really had taken into account into these reports, so they threw in doubt. Um, but really, it, it's it's a techno-scientific framework where you need to prove something, 
you need to understand how much recharge is going to be in the area and how much um, food can be produced in a smaller area. So you, the courts, developing developers can always justify cut that off, and we'll do. We we don't even need that much. So that the way that you write reports and the way that the courts understand information about risk, um, about land use, etc., very much um, filters into the way developers compare um, consulting companies to write those reports. I hope that answers your question. Kate, unbotheredness about uh, commercial farmers and so on. I, I think it's. I don't. I wouldn't say unbothered. Perhaps that was a problematic term, but. I feel like in the PHA specifically, there's farmers that have said, we really are doing our most here. I've risked my entire life. We know she, like she says, that's somewhat not absolutely true. Um, but they've risked their entire livelihoods for uh, in an area that's unsafe, et cetera, and not no one cares. And they must just keep farming, producing the amounts of food, but um, they don't get to tap into any aspirational logics, et cetera. So they basically, some farmers have said to me, um, the only reason that this is a productive area and a valuable area is because of me. If I leave, it's not valuable. It has no use. So um, they've, I think they've engaged with the city of Cape Town and they've said they've been um, received very favorably. But I, don't, I feel that many would rather move elsewhere. There's a, there's a big impact of crime in the PHA. It's surrounded by <coughs> informal settlements, etc. <cetera. coughs> And they basically are khatpo, they just want to leave. So um, unbotheredness, I think they are not willing to speak publicly and, and aspirationally about the area in, in a way that um, would disadvantage them in the end. Nazir Sande has a small farm and doesn't have that much to lose, does have much to lose. These farmers, I don't think they're willing to take the public battle. So they get a lot of benefit from the PHA campaign's activism, but in the PHA, the PHA campaign has no standing, really. So it's an interesting point. Um, Shahid, what's at stake? How do we resolve it? Evaluation criteria. So just to link you on Tumi's question about evaluation. So an EIA is an important um, thing that you need to take to the courts, environmental impact assessment. How will the environment be impacted through this development? But that, the PHA campaign has argued, does not include enough. Um, so they go to CST and they meet with Mark Swilling and all of them, and they ask for a different way of approaching this. They've asked, so now they're asking the developers and asking the courts to ask the developers for an SEA, Social and Ecological Impact Assessment. So that brings in different metrics, different criteria into understanding the value of an area. But in many ways, the value of the area, area and um, the claims are productionist. It's, it's all about, can you produce? That's why the PHA campaign has not had much legitimacy in the area, because if they produced enough, even I think if Nazir Sunday was still using his two hectare farm um, and producing a ton of tomatoes, that might be a different logic. But if you don't produce, you can't say. Um, but I agree, the, the difference. So that's why I think it's an interesting question. But what I show is that how little, how, how little value those kind of aspirational ideas Contest, contestation, like ideas that contest the, the political economy of the area, have how much value, how little value they have in the area. I hope that answers somewhat uh, of your question. We can do another round. Uh, so, who would like to ask some more questions? Alina, I see you smiling. Ask the question. Okay. For those who have spoken, do you want another? Sure, but I answer your question properly. <laughs> Yankee. Okay, um, thanks, Matthew. Um, I don't think you have to respond to this. Um, I just want to say something. I want to say thank you. I think mm -hmm. one can think of how your PhD can be used in about 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and I think it can be an important piece of evidence to show that the land that you're talking about actually has its own right to come as an yeah. Um, the reason I'm saying this is because I want you to talk about how does what we move from um, number one, um, indigenous populations to migrants without acknowledging um, the impact of the processes, colonialism, land acquisitions, yeah, and later on, the Good Areas Act, mm. 
how do you move from indigenous to migrant or African family that there has been an injustice in between? Yeah. Um, or are we referring to migrants as the, you know, people coming from outside the country to, mm. or are we talking about migrants as Helen Zinas? <laughs> so I want to say thank you, and, and, and if you can just maybe uh, talk about the transition. Mm. Mm. Sure, thanks. Um, I'm not so sure if I have a question or comment, but thank you for such a precious presentation. So what, what concerns me when I uh, think about these issues is the wider context of immigration. So, um, and also the demand of uh, housing uh, in Western Europe. I think you've mm. got to engage that. Uh, why do we have so much uh, spiking uh, demand in, in Western Europe? And uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it interests me a lot. Uh, yesterday I was, I was reading uh, statistics, a uh, shocking statistic about how a lot of people tend to gravitate towards uh, coming to the Western Cape. Mm. And what that does is that it, it, it increases uh, demand for housing in the Western Cape. And yeah. I'm not trying to offer a romanticized uh, book by Carl Kemp, but I think you engaged in quite a good Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mizzi. And so I've got a little comment and then show you once another go. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I'm curious, and this is perhaps related to Yankee's question. Uh, you know, Mitchell's plane is, in my understanding, develops alongside Philippi. In the 1970s, as, a, as an apartheid project of essentially finding a finding a kind of new mass colored township, yeah. right? Um, and I'm curious, therefore, about the the dating of these of these maps that you that you put up here, and also the kind of what the apartheid project was here in particular, because you know there's the colonial, as Yankee sort of recorded it, the colonial, then there's the land act. I don't, I don't know the dating of the Cape Town Hunting Club and yeah. when the Germans came, um, um, but but I'm curious about the specific kind of environmental plan of the apartheid period. And you know, did they think that building that was playing next to Philippi um, uh, wouldn't disturb the kind of uh, the, the kind of farming uh, uh, and and even if they were promoting commercial farming, like what was the kind of plan there? Yeah. Uh, how, in a sense, is the, I guess I'm asking, is the kind of environment versus housing yep. contest? Like, what is the history of that? And, and how does one specify that in terms of a fight state planning? Uh, more specifically than just the group areas that, you know, Philippi is zoned in particular ways, yep. uh, you know, agricultural, and there's some, some of Philippi, Philippi East is, is of course, uh, a hard, you know, a, a township. So, what are the what are the histories of zoning here, and how does that relate to a very complicated politics of race mm. um, that is around the kind of a, even a apartheid reconfiguration of what Cape Town colonial Cape Town looks like? Yeah. So take the three. Oh, right, sure. You want to? I'm going to wait. <laughs> it's, it's again um, a fully fair question, but it's around um, the courts. Yep. Um, and, and they you know, the previous sort of question and comments in your response. I'm just trying to think. You seem to be saying that the courts are very limited um, area for struggle. I'm not sure that is what you're saying. But it, and, and I, you know, I can make the case, but it does seem to be that, um, and one would probably have to be strategic about it, but they have proven significant in a whole number of areas around also then appealing to the Constitution ultimately, which in many respects you could say is aspirational, mm -hmm. in certain of its clauses, certainly in, in Bill of Rights, um, around, you know, so that. It's how, I'm not quite clear how you are, what, what your conclusion about the course of the South is. Well, I don't know like what comes to the final conclusion because it's, it's, it's an activism yeah. is a constant process of engagement and adjusting to new contexts and the possibilities of new alliances, I guess, yeah. etc. But it's just, you seem more negative about the course. 
that's an area of struggle. And is that just specific to the way in which it's played out in this context, the way it's been framed, or mm. is it a more general uh, yeah. thought? Cool. Uh, Yankee. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question and uh, about migrants and who are deemed migrants. But I think what happens in the PHA especially is there's, I think, a very strong idea of everyone is outsider. Everyone's an outsider and everyone that is not white and commercial and commercial farmer is an outsider or a migrant. Um, and the PHA campaign sometimes blows that boundary of who is migrant, who does not belong and who does get to belong. So these, these people that were living here, they weren't, they moved, they weren't born in Philippines and, and they hadn't lived there their whole lives. But when this, um, this wedge, this urban edge was shifted, they immediately, like the PHA campaign's affiliation with that group became very sour because they, they weren't in agricultural zone land anymore. So they were outsiders to that space. But your, your question of the indigenous and migrants <laughs> Yeah, it's. I think what my research shows, and this is not an answer, but what my research shows is that it is often just strategically used and framed for certain agendas by the PHA campaign, by the city of Cape Town, and by the commercial farmers in the area. I know that's not a proper answer, but um, it's probably the best I can give you for now. Yeah, Z about demand for housing in the Western Cape. Yeah, it's it's an absolutely fundamental question. And that's why this urban edge was shifted and why a lot of people have lauded this, the shift of this urban edge area. And it wasn't really being farmed. So it's about question of, it's become a moment. Uh, <laughs> came to the conclusion. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it's very important Z, and as you know, it, it increases contestation around sites like this. A lot of people um, in the public and people you speak to around protecting an area for agriculture will just say, we need housing. When was it shifted? Sorry. When? 2011. Right. So this is, I think, 60s, 80s, 2009, 12, 16, now. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's an important it's context, and that's how Carl Kemp frames it in his book. He understands the PHA not as a site necessarily for agriculture or agricultural value, but as a site from which one can understand housing debates. In. Debates about space and land. So it's yeah, it's absolutely essential, Z. And I, I probably should have given it more focus. Bernard, about the history of Mitchell's Plain, etc. So, well, particularly look, if you say the 60s to the 80s, yeah, is a in those first two uh, is a massive is a massive cut, right? Yeah. yeah. And I don't know the geography perfectly, but. Mm. To the right of it, I assume that that's pretty much where Mitchell's plan is planned, yes. right? Yes. So, um, you know, and, and immediately I think about electricity. That there was this myth that under the apartheid state that electricity would go on forever, right? That and power stations would even be commissioned from the 1980s onwards and into the 1990s. That if we had so much power that it was free, right? Uh, you know what's happening, right? Um, uh, with that. So I'm just I'm curious about that earlier moment. Um, you know, and the and how the kind of history of housing and housing versus agricultural land has a tension, a conflict that you said is yeah. in a sense inaugurated in that moment. Yeah, it's an interesting point, something I haven't looked into that much and something that I think is probably very much under researched in the, the area, but I think there is a connection. Um, so the PHA at this point, the sixties, it gets a double designation, agriculture and silica. And that's provides its value, but it's still an instru instrumentalist framing that it can um, be valuable because of that. And I think there was this idea that, um, I don't think there's a coincidence that it just um, works out like that. But um, there's a reading that I was, uh, that frames basically the PHA by Charlotte Lemansky um, that I haven't looked into perfectly about that, but it's an interesting question. I think it, it raises a lot of interesting Questions about decision making, about planning, about bureaucracy, and especially with regards to productivity in the area. So, not much of an answer, but a bit more of a comment back. Uh, Cheryl, the courts. Yeah, so I, I don't mean to come across as, as overly negative about the courts, but what I do in my second last chapter is trace. Uh, someone's been trying to get online the whole time, Rob. Um, 
what I trace is how productive environmental struggles have been in courts. And they have been productive at times. And there's been victories. The PHA campaign winning in 2018 was a victory for the aquifer, for agriculture. That's what they've argued. Um, and a lot of struggles have been bolstered by the courts. But how, how when one tracks the, the trajectory of these court cases that become victories, the one, um, so the, the deadly air case that we've all heard about, I'm sure, and similar cases, when one tracks the origin of those cases, mm-hmm. you have a small group that brings, um, rises and uh, raises an objection, and Lisa, well, uh, Lisa's left, um, but she, this is her work in um, Club by, but a small group that raises an objection, and sometimes that's not even a small group, that's an NGO. And, the, and sometimes when a small group like a PHA campaign goes to court, they have to, and they lose, they appeal. But to appeal to go to court is really expensive. The PHA campaign, if they lost in the high court, which they very, very, very almost did, the entire hopes would have been dashed. They wouldn't have been able to appeal to Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court. Some of the most important cases um, around environmental rights in the country, and you spoke about the Constitution, only come through the Constitutional Court eventually. Um, when they apply to the Constitutional Court after being rejected by the Supreme Court of Appeal. And one of the most important, I think it is the deadly air case, um, there's a minority judgment by Sachs, and he lays out exactly why. It's actually, there's a, there's a coal, coal fire plant that, um, a coal plant that is rejected from developers, uh, for, from being developed in, in, in Pumalanga, only, and it was brought to the courts because um, by a, basically a corporation that supports, uh, they have a monopoly on coal, uh, on fuel in the area. So it was brought to the courts for a group that's not trying to benefit the environment, but they're trying to use the protections of the, con- on the constitution um, to benefit their enterprise. So sometimes there's aspirational work, sometimes they get to a point where it is functional, but to be able to appeal continually to get to the constitutional court is very, it's a very rare thing. And when one does, one is often supported by CER, yeah. Center for Environmental yeah. Rights, um, Environmental Alliance, those kind of groups, Environmental Justice Alliance, etc. cetera. Um, and I argue that this idea of captured representation because after a point, you, you spend your life as an activist like Nazir has, um, and Devine Clutter, other people like that. She was in that slap case. You spend your life trying to fight and go to appeal, to appeal, to appeal, for what? Not much. For the environment, sure, but uh, on a personal level, um, it's, it's it's a lot of risk for not much personal gain. So I think the courts are very useful, and they have helped a lot of movements, and I, I track this from post-apartheid social movements to obviously environmental movements now, but um, yeah, it's it's quite limited at times, and that the the, imp, the implication of having to, or the imperative of having to keep appealing to hopefully win, is problematic. And there's other court cases that are actually in the constitutional court now that um, that are land, landmark cases that haven't been ruled on, which might give me a different opinion and uh, might make me far more positive. Uh, Shahid, oh, to me, and anyone else? Sorry. Okay, so I just wanted to do, okay, so let's just think about this. I guess there's a lot of talk about negative and positive. As an anthropologist, these are not categories we use to analyze a phenomenon, mm-hmm. to be honest, right? No matter what we feel, but whether the court works or not, right? We can look at when those cases, I think your answer is quite important, right? Yeah. That's certain, but you have to look at the trajectory of them and the one that don't. Take the case of land reparations. If one looked at the court, we'll say, oh, look, they did give land. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the majority of people who are sitting on 20-year lists, it's pretty clear that this court is not a, a thing. So I appreciate what you say. I want to go back to this question of value, you know, because your, your paper has helped me see something. Utilitarian logic yep. right, and reason tends to focus around one particular kind of value, often economic value. And this is a very this is endemic to capitalist logic and to colonial logic. Mm-hmm. So when, and you seem to say that that is the, the dominant language around this whole thing. Yeah. Even though there's different uh, counterparts, they all seem to come back to the same thing. Which yeah. means the value of just living in a place and not doing anything is not considered bad. Mm-hmm. Now, people like Michael Tausig, I think if everybody here should read his early book on the devil and commodity fetish. So not because I necessarily agree, contrary to Bernard, with his Marcus analysis of history. 
But because I agree, I'm just joking. But because I agree, we always take it to other. But because I agree, because he has a historical archive there. Yes. And the historical archive is very interesting. And it's basically about the shift from subsistence kind of different forms of agriculture to monoculture. Yep. And what that does. Yep. And what kinds of value are produced for who, where, in what ways. And this is very important. But interestingly, what you help me also see more than that, not a question. So if we have this utilitarian logic, which is very comfortable with capital, very comfortable with colonial, it is the colonial logic. Everybody knows that, right? So there's only economic value. But in South Africa, this argument is inherently racist. It has to be. Because if the people who own the means of production, mm -hmm. historically in 94, like we found out two months ago, 80% of them were owned by one particular company, yep. Yep. then of course, there is a lot, there's a racist logic to that. Mm -hmm. Where economic value, who's producing it, we are producing it. So there's actors involved here. And so I think, in, in, interestingly, to get at some of the stakes of this debate, my question is, what would happen to your argument if you brought in Afriforum? Because Afriforum, most of us would agree, are racist. They don't say they're racist. They're just there for cultural rights. But if you read what they're about, yeah. right, the very same argument. We're producing value, working hard, under threat from crime. The same kind of logic. But interestingly, in this case, what you are telling us is, so this argument about value continues in a very mono way, mm -hmm. but the public is all about the culture. And so it made me think of a broader thing as you develop this work. There are a lot of people who are arguing increasingly, and for a long time have said this, since the 90s, that there's something about a confidence of culture in the post apartheid mm -hmm. You can all have your culture and be free in your culture, but economic practice is outside of culture. It's something, it's either scientific or it's government policy or it's, you know, and so utilitarian logic, I mean, we know how, how this works. Mm. Um, so anyway, that's just a broader question. Another small point, um, though related to this, but Nazir. Mm. Yeah, so that's the first point. Just think about this broader thing, like what is the saying? What is your data actually saying about how rights are drawn, about how value is mediated by the courts, by the media in South Africa? What it actually says about South Africa? I think it's more important than just, you know, the problems yeah. It's about a that's much deeper kind of idea. And how these ideas, and I know people like Stephen and others wrote about this stuff already in the 90s, you know, cultural claims versus other kinds of claims. <laughs> but then there's the problem, you say, okay, you weren't taking this here and then for granted. But, but are you being critical about that? That's what I'm wondering, you know. Not taking for granted is one thing, you don't have to buy into all this stuff. Yeah. But are you being critical? And the two things that are interesting here is one that the PHA <laughs> seems to promote this idea of community engagement, which you mentioned. They try to hold these forums. Community engagement yeah. is widely understood as like, you know, part of these neoliberal technologies of, of, yeah. of, of consent making. Yeah. The other technique is monoculture. It's interesting because Nazir is actually doing monoculture. As much as producing less than you say the average, it's still tomatoes and only tomatoes. And so I'm just wondering, but we also look at that value process. You know, what is his contestation entailing yeah. when his solution is monoculture? Because once you're playing the same game as the yeah. bigger guys, you know, but producing less. So that's something to think about. And the last one is very small, just to go. I didn't say that no, these people didn't work hard. Yeah. And it's not true. It's just to say that hard work in itself is a critical fact it doesn't tell me about the broader issue. Mm. One person works hard but has a safety net where in the case of drought, the government comes and says, yeah, take a load. Yeah. That's very different from another guy that works hard and doesn't have that kind of racial state behind yep. it. You know, and the only example I could think of is Israel. That Israelis work very hard to build their state, mm -hmm. but at the same time they systematically genocide Palestinians. Yep. <laughs> right? yep. So I think they're not they're not complicated. They're not opposing things. Mm -hmm. It's not about empiricism versus some idea. It's about understanding the context, right, and the networks. And the, yeah. But anyway, I think the two important things are kinds of value of the yeah. public and the law, and the other thing about what Nasir is actually doing and his reasoning, and whether that reasoning is actually somehow also feeding back into the very thing he contests. Okay, so just a correction point. He doesn't do um, monoculture anymore. Oh. Agroecological. Um, and, and various types of uh, farming and stuff, but that his production is so low now yeah. that it actually so he gets to use that aspirational logic rather than like you say buying into the system mm -hmm. and trying to 
and contested when you're doing the same thing, which is on a smaller scale. So that's an interesting point. Your point about AFRIFORUM, yeah, AFRIFORUM has a lot of signs in the PHA. We are, I'm part of AFRIFORUM. We will protect our farmers and all that. What? What? You said they have a lot of what? Signs. Like signs, uh, signs that put, people put on their farms. Signs. Signs. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's the classic, the, the, the white farm is under threat. Um, we will protect us. We are the only people bringing this area of value. And it's, again, embedded in the old German history of we produce value because you couldn't, um, which is funny um, and, and deeply tragic. Um, hard work embodied, embodied, embedded in politics. Absolutely. I think so. What Nazir Sunday is trying to show is that, um, that it's very well. What my research shows is trying to contest this entrenched hegemonic white commercial farmer logic is extremely difficult through various avenues um, and he's regardless of what he's trying to produce or what his vision for the pha is he keeps talking about the vision for the pha and the shared vision for the pha um, that doesn't really matter i think but um also then that answers your other question about these community who does he represent the communities he's engaging community and um, consideration and so on in many ways, when he has these shared visions for the PHA, he brings four people that he knows from the broader area and they have a discussion and they create a shared vision for the PHA. This biocultural community protocol thing that I've spoken about somewhere is very much a way of develop, leveraging the politics of community representation, representation for certain areas, for certain resources and say, this is our area, so we should be able to speak for it. And it's very, um, so this, that was fundamental during the Roybos case. Um, and getting community, indigenous communities to get rights and share percentages of the shares for Roybos. Um, and he's trying to work with those lawyers, Natural Justice and Cormac Cullinan, who's on the Shell case, etc. He's trying to work with them to develop a community vision for the PHA, which means his vision for the PHA with some people supporting it. Um, so it's, it's, it's very interesting how uh, certain groups use the politics of community consultation for their own vision. Um, Nazir, it's trying to do it in a different way, but it has the same outcome. Yeah. Uh, the rest of them, thank you for the comments, and I appreciate it. Well, Mesh, I want to find out. So the PHA campaign try and develop, they try to implement their two hectare model um, in the PHA with various communities. They said, look, you farmers on these farms, you, you the workers on these farms, why farm for other people, farm for yourself? We'll help you, we'll give you the resources from our white contacts in the suburbs and will help you develop your own farm, right? That has failed every time they've tried it. Uh, they try to say, decolonial, grow your own food for yourself, don't depend on the market, these kind of logics, which are very aspirational and pretty interesting. And they failed every single time with every bit of resource. And there's so many community politics in these small settlements, et cetera, gendered politics, men not coming to consultation. We had, we literally, I spent, months going to nighttime meetings in these communities after people came back from the work on the farms and we had countless meetings with people creating a shared vision for this community kitchen that would feed the children in the area and so on and then when we came time to implement the men in the community were like no we weren't asked to be part of it meanwhile they were which is a classic as well so my answer to you is i hope that um the area is farmed by more than five commercial farmers that are white and connected to these histories. Um, but on a realistic level, I think the way the city of Cape Town has valued the area for productionist logics and so on, I, I don't see Nazir Sunday's farm and his campaign and the PHA campaign um, being around in, in 20 years. Him and Susanna, who are the two leaders of the movement, said, what happens when we retire? I can't keep doing this. So, um, and it's an interesting thing. When we think about activists, we just think about activists as actors, as people that do things. We don't think about them as humans wanting to say, okay, 
I've fought my battle and now I can move on. Um, and Nazir has spoken publicly about t finding time to move on and retire elsewhere. So it'll be interesting and I hope it's far more positive than what I've showed today. Yeah. Well, uh, what they used to call it at a certain point, old crusty commies. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I'd like to thank Matthew very much for subjecting himself to the public. Congratulate him again on the, doc on, the, on the successful doctorate and good luck uh, in taking this work forward. And I hope the seminar was useful in provoking ways to do that. Yeah, it was. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you all. Next week, Z will, uh, will be presenting. And uh, I hope the, to see you all again here. So thank you. Thank you.